can't imagine for Saruman's private use, I fancy. I never knew that it went so far abroad, but it comes in handy now. It would, said Gimli, if I had a pipe to go with it. Alas, I lost mine in Moria, or before. Is there no pipe in all your plunder? No, I'm afraid not, said Mary. We have not found any, and not even here in the guardrooms. Saruman kept his dainty to himself, it seems, and I don't think it would be any use knocking on the doors of Orthanc to beg a pipe of him. We shall have to share pipes as good friends must at a pinch. Half a moment, said Pippin. Putting his hand inside the breast of his jacket, he pulled out a little soft wallet on a string. I keep a treasure or two near my skin, as precious as rings to me. Here's one, my old wooden pipe. And here's another, an unused one. I've carried it a long way, though I don't know why. Never really expected to find any pipeweed on the journey when my own ran out. But now it comes in useful after all. He held up a small pipe with a wide flattened bowl and handed it to Gimli. Does that settle the score between us? He said. Settle it? cried Gimli. Most noble hobbit, it leaves me deep in your debt. Well, I am going back into the open air to see what the wind and sky are doing, said Legolas, said Aragorn. They went out and seated themselves upon the pile of stones before the gateway. They could see far down into the valley now. The mists were lifting and floating away upon the breeze. Now, let us take our ease here for a little, said Aragorn. We will sit on the edge of ruin and talk, as Gandalf says, while he is busy elsewhere. I feel a weariness such as I have seldom felt before. He wrapped his grey cloak about him, hiding his mail shirt, and stretched out his long legs. Then he lay back and sent from his lips a thin stream of smoke. Look, said Pippin. Strider the ranger has come back. He has never been away, said Aragorn. I am Strider the Dunedan too, and I belong both to Gondor and the North. They smoked in silence for a while, and the sun shone on them, slanting into the valley from among the white clouds high in the west. Legolas lay still, looking up at the sun and sky with steady eyes, and singing softly to himself. At last he sat up. Come now, he said. Time wears on and the mists are blowing away, or would if your strange folk did not breathe yourself in smoke. What of the tale? Well, my tale begins with waking up in the dark and finding myself all strung up in an orc camp, said Pippin. Let me see. What, what, what is it today? The 5th of March in the Shire Reckoning, said Aragorn. Pippin made some calculations on his fingers. Only, only nine days ago, he said. It seems a year since we were caught. Well, though half of it was like a bad dream. I reckon that three very horrible days followed. Mary will correct me if I forget anything important. I'm not going into details. The whips and the filth and stench and all that, it does not bear remembering. With that, he plunged into an account of Boromir's last fight, and the orc march from Emin Wheel to the forest. The others nodded as the various points were fitted in with their guesses. Here are some treasures that you let fall, said Aragorn. You will be glad to have them back. He loosened his belt from under his cloak and took from it the two sheathed knives. Well, said Merry. I never expected to see those again. I marked a few orcs of mine, but Ugluk took them away from us. How he glared. At first I thought he was going to stab me, but he threw the things away as if they burned him. And here also is your brooch, Pippin, said Aragorn. I've kept it safe, for it is a very precious thing. I know, said Pippin. It was a wrench to let it go, but what else could I do? Nothing else, answered Aragorn. One who cannot cast away a treasure at need is in fetters. You did rightly. A cutting of the bands on your wrists, that was smart work, said Gimli. Luck served you there, but you seized your chance with both hands, one might say, said Legolas. Unfortunately not, said Pippin. But you did not know about Grishnak. He shuddered and said no more, leaving Merry to tell of those last horrible moments. 
The pawing hands, the hot breath, and the dreadful strength of Grishnak's hairy arms. All this about the orcs of Baradu, Lugberts as they call it, makes me uneasy, said Aragorn. The Dark Lord already knew too much, and his servants also, and Grishnak evidently sent some message across the river after the quarrel. The Red Eye will be looking towards Isengard, but Saruman at any rate is in a cleft stick of his own cutting. Yes, whichever side wins, his outlook is poor, said Merry. Things began to go all wrong for him the moment his orc set foot in Rohan. We caught a glimpse of the old villain, or so Gandalf thinks, said Gimli. On the edge of the forest. When was that? Asked Pippin. Five nights ago, said Aragorn. Let me see, said Merry. Five nights ago. Now we come to a part of the story you know nothing about. We met Treebeard that morning after the battle... And that night we were at Wellinghall, one of his ent houses. The next morning we went to Entboot, a gathering of ents, that is, and the queerest thing I've ever seen in my life. It lasted all that day and the next, and we spent the nights with an ent called Quickbeam. And then, late in the afternoon, in the third day of their moot, the ents suddenly blew up. It was amazing! The forest had felt as tense as if a thunderstorm was brewing inside it. Then, all at once, it exploded. I wish you could have heard their song as they marched. If Saruman had heard it, he would be a hundred miles away by now, even if he had to run on his own two legs, said Pippin. The Isengard be strong and hard, as coal as stone, as bare as bone. We go, we go, we go to war, to hew the stone and break the door. There was very much more. A great deal of the song had no words. It was like music of horns and drums. It was very exciting. But I thought it was only marching music and no more. Just a song. Until I got here. I know better now. We came down over the last ridge into Nan Kuranir after the night had fallen, Mary continued. It was then that I first had the feeling that the forest itself was moving behind us. I thought I was dreaming an Entish dream, but Pippin had noticed it too. We were both frightened, but we did not find out more about it until later. It was the Huorns, or so the Ents call them in short language. Treebeard won't say much about them, but I think they are Ents that have become almost like trees, at least to look at. They stand here and there in the wood or under its eaves, silent, watching endlessly over the trees. But deep in the darkest dales, there are hundreds and hundreds of them, I believe. There is a great power in them, and they seem able to wrap themselves in shadow. It is difficult to see them moving, but they do. They can move very quickly if they're angry. You stand still looking at the weather, maybe, or listening to the rustling of the wind, and then suddenly you find that you are in the middle of a wood with great groping trees all around you. They still have voices and can speak with the ants. That is why they are called Huorns, Treebeard says. But they have become queer and wild. Dangerous. I should be terrified of meeting them if there were no true ants about to look after them. Well, in the early night we crept down a long ravine into the upper end of the Wizard's Vale. The Ents, with all their rustling horns behind. We could not see them, of course, but the whole air was full of creaking. It was very dark, a cloudy night. They moved at a great speed as soon as they had left the hills and made a noise like a rushing wind. The moon did not appear through the clouds, and not long after midnight there was a tall wood all around the north side of Isengard. There was no sign of enemies nor any challenge. There was a light gleaming from a high window in the tower. That was all. Treebird and a few more ants crept on, right round to within sight of the great gates. Pippin and I were with him. We were sitting on Treebeard's shoulders, and I could feel the quivering tenseness in him. But even when they are roused, ants can be very cautious and patient. They stood still as carved stones, breathing and listening. Then all at once there was a tremendous stir. Trumpets blared and the walls of Isengard echoed. We thought that we had been discovered and that battle was going to begin. But nothing of the sort. All Saruman's people were marching away. I don't know much about this war or about the horsemen of Rowan, but Saruman seems to have meant to finish off the king and all his men with one final blow. He emptied Isengard. I saw the enemy go. Endless lines of marching orcs, and troops of them mounted on great wolves. And there were battalions of men too. Many of them carried torches. 
and in the flare I could see their faces. Most of them were ordinary men, rather tall and dark-haired, and grim but not particularly evil-looking, but there were some others that were horrible, man-high, but with goblin faces, sallow, leering, squint-eyed. Do you know, they reminded me at once of that southerner at Bree. Only he was not so obviously orc-like it as most of these were. I thought of him too, said Aragorn. We had many of these half orcs to deal with at Helm's Deep. It seemed plain now that the southerner was a spy of Saruman's. But whether he was working with the Black Riders or for Saruman alone, I do not know. It is difficult with these evil folk to know when they are in league, and when they are cheating one another. Well, of all sorts together, there must have been ten thousand at the very least, said Mary. They took an hour to pass out of the gates, some went off down the highway to the forts, and some turned away and went eastward. A bridge has been built down there, about a mile away, where the river runs in a very deep channel. You could see it now if you stood up. They were all singing with harsh voices and laughing, making a hideous din. I thought things looked very black for Rowan, but Treebeard did not move. He said, My business is with Isengard tonight, with rock and stone. But, though I could not see what was happening in the dark, I believe that Huorns began to move south as soon as the gates were shut again. Their business was with orcs, I think. They were far down the valley in the morning, or at any rate, there was a shadow there that one couldn't see through. As soon as Saruman had sent off all his army, or turn came, Treebeard put us down, and went up to the gates, and began hammering on the doors, and calling for Saruman. There was no answer, except arrows and stones from the walls. But arrows are no use against ants. They hurt them, of course, and infuriate them, like stinging flies. But an ant can be stuck as full of orc arrows as a pincushion and take no serious harm. They cannot be poisoned, for one thing, and their skin seems to be very thick and tougher than bark. It takes a very heavy axe stroke to wound them seriously. They don't like axes, but there would have to be a great many axemen to one ant. A man that hacks once at an ant never gets a chance of a second blow. A punch from an ant fist crumples up iron like, like thin tin. When Treebeard had got a few arrows in him, he began to warm up, and he gets positively hasty, as he would say. He let out a great hoom hom, and a dozen more ants came striding up. An angry ant is terrifying. Their fingers and their toes just freeze onto rock, and they tear it up like bread crust. It was like watching the work of great tree roots in a hundred years, all packed into a few moments. They pushed, pulled, tore, shook, and hammered, and clang, bang, crash, crack. In five minutes they had these huge gates just lying in room, and some were already beginning to eat into the walls, like rabbits in a sandpit. I don't know what Saruman thought was happening, but anyway he did not know how to deal with it. His wizardry may have been falling off lately, of course, but anyway I think he has not much grit. Not much plain courage alone in a tight place without a lot of slaves and machines and things, if you know what I mean. Very different from old Gandalf. I wonder if his fame was not all along mainly due to his cleverness in settling at Isengard. Hmm. No, said Aragorn. Once he was great as his fame made him. His knowledge was deep. His thought was subtle, and his hands marvelously skilled. He had a power over the minds of others. The wise he could persuade, and the smaller folk he could daunt. That power he certainly still keeps. There are not many in Middle-earth that I should say were safe, if they were left alone to talk with him, even now when he has suffered a defeat. Gandalf, Elrond, and Galadriel, perhaps, now that his wickedness had been laid bare, but very few others. The ants are safe, said Pippin. He seems at one time to have got round them, but never again. And anyway, he did not understand them. He made the great mistake of leaving them out of his calculations. He had no plan for them, and there was no time to make any once they had set to work. As soon as our attack began, the few remaining rats in Isengard started bolting through every hole that the Ents made. The Ents let men go, after they had questioned them. Two or three dozen only down at this end. I don't think many orc folk of any size escaped. Not from the Huorns. There was a wood full of them all around Isengard by that time, as well as those that had gone down the valley when the Ents had reduced a large part of the southern wall to rubbish, and what was left of his people had bolted and deserted him, 
Saruman fled in a panic. He seemed to have been at the gates when we arrived. I expect he came to watch his splendid army march out. When the ends broke their way in, he left in a hurry. They did not spot him at first, but the night had opened out, and there was a great light of stars. Quite enough for Ents to see by, and suddenly Quickbeam gave a cry. Quickbeam is a gentle creature, but he hates Saruman all the more fiercely for that. His people suffered cruelly from Oragaxes. He leapt down the path from the inner gate, and he can move like a wind when he is roused. There was a pale figure hurrying away in and out of the shadows of the pillars, and it had nearly reached the stairs to the tower door. But it was a near thing. Quickbeam was so hot after him that he was within a step or two of being caught and strangled when he slipped in through the door. When Saruman was safe back in Orthanc, it was not long before he set some of his precious machinery to work. By that time there were many ends inside Isengard, and others had burst into from north and east. They were roaming about and doing a great deal of damage. Suddenly up came fires and foul fumes. The vents and shafts all over the plain began to spout and belch. Several of the ants got scorched and blistered. One of them, Beachburn I think he was called, a very tall handsome ant, got caught in a spray of some liquid fire and burned like a torch. A horrible sight. That sent them mad. I thought that they had been really aroused before, but I was wrong. I saw what it was like at last. It was staggering. They roared and boomed and trumpeted until stones began to crack and fall the mere noise of them. Mary and I lay on the ground and stuffed our cloaks into our ears. Round and round the rock of Orthan, the ants went striding and storming like a howling gale, breaking pillars, hurling avalanches of boulders down into the shafts, tossing up huge slabs of stone and into the air like leaves. The tower was in the middle of a spinning whirlwind. I saw iron posts and blocks of masonry go rocketing up hundreds of feet and smash against the windows of Orthan. But Treebeard kept his head. He had not had any burns, luckily. He did not want his folk to hurt themselves in their fury, and he did not want Saruman to escape out of some hole in the confusion. Many of the Ents were hurling themselves against the Orthanc rock, but that defeated them. It is very smooth and hard. Some wizardries in it, perhaps, older and stronger than Saruman's. Anyway, they could not get a grip on it, or make a crack at it, and they were bruising and wounding themselves against it. So Treebeard went out into the ring and shouted. His enormous voice rose above all the din. There was a dead silence suddenly. In it, we heard a shrill laugh from a high window in the tower. That had a queer effect on the ends. They had been boiling over, now they became cold, grim as ice and quiet. They left the plain and gathered round Treebeard, standing quite still. He spoke to them for a little in their own language. I think he was telling them of a plan he had made in his old head long before. Then, they just faded silently away in the grey light. Day was dawning by that time. They set a watch on the tower, I believe. But the watchers were so well hidden in shadows and kept so still that I could not see them. The others went away north. All that day they were busy, out of sight. Most of the time they were left alone. It was a dreary day, and we wandered about a bit. Though we kept out of view from the windows of Orthanc, as much as we could. They stared at us so threateningly. A good deal of time we spent looking for something to eat. And also we sat and talked, wondering what was happening away south in Rohan, and what had become of all the rest of our company. Every now and then we could hear in the distance the rattle and fall of stone, and thudding noises echoing in the hills. In the afternoon we walked around the circle and went to have a look at what was going on. There was a great shadowy wood of horns at the end of the valley, and another around the northern wall. We did not dare to go in but there was a rending, tearing noise of work going on inside. Ants and horns were digging great pits and trenches, and making great pools and dams, gathering all the waters of the Eisen and every other spring and stream that they could find. We left them to it. At dusk, Treebeard came back to the gate. He was humming and booming to himself and seemed pleased. He stood and stretched his great arms and legs and breathed deep. I asked him if he was tired. Tired? He said. Tired? Well, no, not tired, but stiff. Mm, I need a good draught of wash. We have worked hard, 
We have done more stone cracking and earth gnawing today than we have done in many a long year before. But it is nearly finished. When night falls, do not linger near this gate or in the old tunnel. Water may come through, and it will be foul water for a while until all the filth of Saruman is washed away. Then, Eisen can run clear again. He began to pull down a bit more of the walls, in a leisurely sort of way, just to amuse himself. We were just wondering where it would be safe to lie and get some sleep, when the most amazing thing of all happened. There was a sound of a rider coming swiftly up the road. Mary and I lay quiet, and Treebeard hid himself in the shadows under the arch. Suddenly, a great horse came striding up like a flash of silver. It was already dark, but I could see the rider's face clearly. It seemed to shine, and all his clothes were white. I just sat up, staring, with my mouth open. I tried to call out and couldn't. There was no need. He halted just by us and looked down at us. I said at last, but my voice was only a whisper. Did he say, Hello, Pippin. This is a pleasant surprise. No, indeed. He said, Get up, you dumb fool of a duke. Where in the name of wonder in all this ruin is Treebeard? I want him. Quick. Treebeard heard his voice and came out of the shadows at once, and there was a strange meeting. I was surprised, because neither of them seemed surprised at all. Gandalf obviously expected to find Treebeard here, and Treebeard might almost have been loitering about near the gates on purpose to meet him. Yet we had told the old Ed all about Moria. But then I remembered the queer look he gave us at the time. I can only suppose that he had seen Gandalf or had some news of him, but I would not say anything in a hurry. Don't be hasty, is his motto. But nobody, not even elves, will say much about Gandalf's movements when he is not there. said Treebeard. I am glad that you have come. Wood and water, stock and stone, I can master. But there is a wizard to manage here. Treebeard, said Gandalf. I need your help. You have done much, but I need more. I have about ten thousand orcs to manage. Then those two went off and had a council together, in some corner. It must have seemed very hasty to Treebeard, for Gandalf was in a tremendous hurry and was already talking at a great pace before they passed out of hearing. They were only away a matter of minutes, perhaps a quarter of an hour. Then Gandalf came back to us, and he seemed relieved, almost merry. But he did say he was glad to see us then. But, but Gandalf... I cried. Where have you been? And, where, and have you seen the others? Wherever I have been, I am back. He answered in the genuine Gandalf manner. Yes, I have seen some of the others, but news must wait. This is a perilous night, and I must ride fast. But the dawn may be brighter, and if so, we shall meet again. Take care of yourselves, and keep away from all thank. Goodbye. Treebeard was very thoughtful after Gandalf had gone. He had evidently learned a lot in a short time and was digesting it. He looked at us and said, mm, Well, I find you are not such hasty folk as I thought. You said much less than you might, and no more than you should. This is a bundle of news and no mistake. Well now, Treebeard must get busy again. Before he went, we got a little news out of him. And it did not cheer us up at all. But for the moment we thought more about you three than about Frodo and Sam. Or about poor Boromir. For we gathered that there was a great battle going on, or soon would be, and that you were in it, and might never come out of it. Wounds will help, said Treebeard. Then he went away, and we did not see him again until this morning. It was deep night. We lay on top of a pile of stone, and could see nothing beyond it. Mist or shadows blotted out everything like a great blanket all around us. The air seemed hot and heavy, and it was full of rustlings, creakings, and murmur-like voices passing. I think that hundreds more of the Huorans must have been passing by to help in the battle. Later there was a great rumble of thunder away south, and flashes of lightning far away across Rohan. Every now and then we could see mountain peaks miles and miles away step out suddenly, black and white, and then vanish. And behind us were noises like thunder in hills, 
but different. At times the whole valley echoed. It must have been about midnight when the Ents broke the dams and poured all the gathered waters through a gap in the northern wall, down into Isengard. The horn dark had passed, and the thunder had rolled away. The moon was sinking behind the western mountains. Isengard began to fill up with black creeping streams and pools. They glittered in the last light of the moon as they spread over the plain. Every now and then the waters found their way down into some shaft or spout hole. Great white streams hissed up, smoke rose in billows. There were explosions and gusts of fire. One great coil of vapour went whirling up, twisting round and round Orthanc, until it looked like a tall peak of cloud, fiery underneath and moonlit above. And still more water poured in, until at last Isengard looked like a huge flat saucepan, all streaming and bubbling. We saw a cloud of smoke and steam from the south last night, when we came to the mouth of Nan Kurunir, said Aragorn. We feared that Saruman was brewing some new devilry on us. Not he, said Pippin. He was probably choking and not laughing anymore. By the morning, yesterday morning, the water had sunk down into all the holds, and there was a dense fog. We took refuge in that guard room over there, and we had rather a fright. The lake began to overflow and pour out through the old tunnel, and the water was rapidly rising up the steps. We thought we were going to get caught like orcs in a hold. But we found a winding stair at the back of the stair room that brought us out on top of the arch. It was a squeeze to get at, as the passages had been cracked and half blocked with fallen stones near the top. There we sat, high up above the floods and watched the drowning of Isengard. The Ents kept on pouring in more water, till all the fires were quenched and every cave filled. The fog slowly gathered together and streamed up into a huge umbrella of cloud. It must have been a mile high. In the evening there was a great rainbow over the eastern hills, and then the sunset was blotted out by a thick drizzle on the mountain sides. It all went very quiet. A few wolves howled mournfully, far away. The Ents stopped the inflow in the night and sent the Eisen back into its old course. And that was the end of it all. Since then, the water has been sinking again. There must be outlets somewhere from the caves underneath, I think. If Saruman peeps out of any of his windows, it must look an untidy, dreary mess. We felt very lonely, not even a visible end to talk to in all the ruin and no news. We spent the night up on top here above the arch, and it was cold and damp, and we did not sleep. We had a feeling that anything might happen at any minute. Saruman is still in his tower. There was a noise in the night, like a wind coming up the valley. I think the Ents and Hurons that had been away came back then, but where they have all gone to now, I don't know. It was a misty, moisty morning when we climbed down and looked round again, and nobody was about. And that is about all there is to tell. It seems almost peaceful now after all the turmoil. And safer too somehow, since Gandalf came back. I could sleep. They all fell silent for a while. Gimli refilled his pipe. There is one thing I wonder about. He said as he lit it with his flint and tinder. Wormtongue. You told Theoden he was with Saruman. How did he get there? Oh yes. I forgot about him, said Pippin. He did not get here till this morning. We had just lit the fire and had some breakfast when Treebeard appeared again. We heard him hooping and calling our names outside. Farewell, my lads, he said. Don't you give you some The have come back. He laughed and slapped his thighs. And there will be folk coming up from the south before the day is old. Some that you may be glad to see. He had hardly said that when we heard the sound of hoofs on the road. We rushed out before the gates and I stood and stared, half expecting to see Strider and Gandalf come riding up at the head of an army. But out of the mist, there rode a man on an old tarred horse. And he looked a queer, twisted sort of creature himself. There was no one else. When he came out of the mist and suddenly saw all the ruin and wreckage in front of him, he sat and gasped. And his face went almost green. He was so bewildered that he did not seem to notice us at first. When he did, he gave a cry and tried to turn his horse round and ride off. But Treebeard took three strides, 
put out a long arm and lifted him out of the saddle. His horse bolted in terror, and he groveled on the ground. He said he was Grima, a friend and counsel of the king, and had been sent with important messages from Theoden to Saruman. No one else would dare to ride through the open land, so full of foul orcs, he said. So I was sent, and I have had a journey, and I am hungry and weary. I fled far north out of my way, pursued by wolves. I caught the sidelong looks he gave to Treebeard, and I said to myself, Liar. Treebeard looked at him in his long, slow way for several minutes, till the wretched man was squirming on the floor. Then at last he said, Ah, hmm. I was expecting you, Master Worm Tongue. The man started at that name. Gandalf got here first. So I know as much about you as I need, and I know what to do with you. Put all the rats in one trap, said Gandalf, and I will. I am master of Isengard now, but Saruman is locked in his tower, and you can go there and give him all the messages that you can think of. Let me go, let me go, said Wyrmdan. I know the way. You knew the way. I don't doubt, said Treebeard. But things have changed here a little. Go and see. He let Wormtongue go. And he limped off through the arch, with us close behind, until he came inside the ring and could see all the floods that lay between him and Orthanc. Then he turned to us. Let me go away. My messages are useless now. They are indeed, said Treebeard. But you have only two choices. To stay with me until Gandalf and your master arrive, or to cross the water. Which will you have? The man shivered at the mention of his master, and put a foot into the water, but drew back. I cannot swim, he said. The water is not deep, said Treebeard. It is dirty, but that will not harm you, Master Wormtongue. In you go now. With that, the wretch floundered off into the flood. It rose up nearly to his neck before he got too far away from me to see him. At the last I saw of him was clinging into some old barrel or piece of wood. But Treebeard waded off after him and watched his progress. Well, he has gone in. He said when he returned. I saw him crawling up the steps like a dragon rat. There is someone in the tower still. A hand came out and pulled him in. So there he is. And I hope the welcome is to his liking. Now I must go and wash myself clean of this slime. I'll be away up on the north side if anyone wants to see me. There is no clean water down here fit for an end to drink or to bathe in. So I will ask you two lads to keep a watch at the gate for the folk that are coming. There'll be the Lord of the Fields of Rohan, mark you. You must welcome him as well as you know how. His men have fought a great fight with the orcs. Maybe you know the right fashion for men's words for such a lord. Better than ends. There have been many lords in the green fields in my time. And I have never learned their speech, or their names. They will be wanting man food, and you know all about that, I guess. So find what you think is fit for a king to eat, if you can. And that is the end of the story. Though I should like to know who this Wormtongue is. Was he really the king's counsellor? He was, said Aragorn. And also Saruman's spy and servant in Rohan. Fate has not been kinder to him than he deserves. The sight of the ruin of all that he thought so strong and magnificent must have been almost punishment enough. But I fear that worse awaits him. Yes, I don't suppose Treebeard sent him to Orthanc out of kindness, said Merry. He seemed rather grimly delighted with the business, and was laughing to himself when he went to get his bathe and drink. We spent a busy time after that searching the flotsam and rummaging about. We found two or three storerooms in different places nearby, above the flood level. But Treebeard sent some ends down, and they carried off a great deal of their stuff. The ends said, 
so you can see that somebody had counted your company carefully before you arrived. You three were evidently meant to go with the great people, but you would not have fared any better. We kept as good as we sent, I promise you. Better because we sent no drink. What about drink? I said to the ants. They said, But I hope the Ents may have found time to brew some of their drafts from the mountain springs, and we all see Gandalf's beard curling when he returns. After the Ents had gone, we felt tired and hungry, but we did not grumble. Our labors had been well rewarded. It was through our search for man food that Pippin discovered the prize of all the flotsam, those horn blower barrels. Pipe is better after food, said Pippin. That is how the situation arose. Said Gimli. All except one thing. Said Aragorn. Be from the south, Father Isengard. The more I consider it, the more curious I find it. I have never been to Isengard, but I have journeyed in this land, and I know well the empty countries that lie between Rohan and the Shire. Neither goods nor folk have passed that way for many a long year, not openly. So Aramon had secret dealings with someone in the Shire, I guess. Worm tongues may be found in other houses than King Theoden's. Was there a date on the barrels? Yes said Pippin. It was the 1417 crop. That is last year's. Uh, no, the year before. Of course, now, a good year. Whatever evil is afoot is over now, I hope, or else it is beyond our reach at present, said Aragorn. Yet I think I shall mention it to Gandalf, small matter though it may seem among his great affairs. I wonder what he's doing, said Merry. The afternoon is getting on. Let us go and look around. You can enter Isengard now at any rate, Strider, if you want to, but it is not a very cheerful sight. They passed through the ruined tunnel and stood upon a heap of stones, gazing at the dark rock of Orthanc and its many windows, a menace still in the desolation that lay all about it. The waters had now nearly all subsided. Here and there gloomy pools remained, covered with scum and wreckage. But most of the wide circle was bare again, a wilderness of slime and tumbled rock, pitted with blackened holes, and dotted with posts and pillars, leaning drunkenly, this way and that. At the rim of the shattered bowl there lay vast mounds and slopes, like the shingles cast up by a great storm, and beyond them the green and tangled valley ran up into the long ravine between the dark arms of the mountains. Across the waste they saw riders picking their way, they were coming from the north side, and already they were drawing near to Orthanc. There is Gandalf and Theoden and his men, said Legolas. Let us go and meet them. Walk warily, said Merry. There are loose slabs that may tilt up and throw you down into a pit if you don't take care. They followed what was left of the road from the gates to Orthanc, going slowly, for the ragstones were cracked and slimed. The riders, seeing them approached, halted under the shadow of the rock and waited for them. Gandalf rode forward to meet them. Well, Treebeard and I have had some interesting discussion and made a few plans, he said. And we have all had some much-needed rest. Now we must be going on again. I hope you companions have all rested too, and refreshed yourselves. We have, said Merry. But our discussion began and ended with smoke. Still we feel less ill-disposed towards Saruman than we did. Do you indeed, said Gandalf. Well, I do not. I have now a last task to do before I go. I must pay Saruman a farewell visit. Dangerous and probably useless, but it must be done. Those of you who wish may come with me, but beware, and do not jest. This is not the time for it. I will come, said Gimli. I wish to see him and learn if he really looks like you. And how will you learn that, Master Dwarf? said Gandalf. Saruman could look like me in your eyes, if it suited his purpose with you. And are you yet wise enough to detect all his counterfeits? Well, we shall see, perhaps. He may be shy of showing himself before many different eyes together. But I have ordered all the Ents to remove themselves from sight, so perhaps we shall persuade him to come out. Asked Pippin. The last is most likely, if you ride to his door with a light heart, said Gandalf. But there is no knowing what he can do, or may choose to try. A wild beast cornered is not safe to approach. And Saruman has powers you do not guess. Beware of his voice. They came now to the foot of Orthanc. It was black, 
and the rock gleamed as if it were wet. The many faces of the stone had sharp edges, as though they had been newly chiseled. A few scorings and small flake-like splinters near the base were all the marks that it bore in the fury of the Ents. On the eastern side, in the angle of two piers, there was a great door, high above the ground, and over it was a shuttered window, opening upon a balcony hedged with iron bars. Up to the threshold of the door there mounted a flight of twenty-seven broad stairs, hewn by some unknown art of the same black stone. This was the only entrance to the tower, but many tall windows were cut with deep embrasures in the climbing walls. Far up they peered like little eyes in the sheer faces of the horns. At the foot of the stairs, Gandalf and the king dismounted. I will go up, said Gandalf. I have been in Orthanc and I know my peril. And I too will go up, said the king. I am old and fear no peril any more. I wish to speak with the enemy who has done me so much wrong. Eamel shall come with me and see that my aged feet do not falter. As you will, said Gandalf. Aragorn shall come with me. Let the others await us at the foot of the stairs. They will hear and see enough, if there is anything to hear or see, said Gimli. Own here represent our kindreds. We also will come behind. Come then, said Gandalf, and with that he climbed the steps, and Theoden went beside him. The riders of Rohan sat uneasily upon their horses, on either side of the stair, and looked up darkly at the great tower, fearing what might befall their lord. Merry and Pippin sat on the bottom step, feeling both unimportant and unsafe. Half a sticky mile from here to the gate, muttered Pippin. I wish I could slip off back to the guardroom unnoticed. What did we come for? We are not wanted. Gandalf stood before the door of Orthang and beat on it with his staff. It rang with a hollow sound. Saruman! He cried in a loud, commanding voice. Saruman! Come forth! For some time there was no answer. At last the window above the door was unbarred, but no figure could be seen at its dark opening. Who is it? said a voice. What do you wish? Theoden started. I know that voice, he said, and I cursed the day when I first listened to it. Go and fetch Saruman since you have become his footman, Grima Worm Tongue said Gandalf. And do not waste our time! The window closed. They waited. Suddenly another voice spoke, low and melodious, its very sound an enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words that they heard, and if they did, they wondered, for little power remained in them. Mostly they remembered that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking. All that it said seemed wise and reasonable, and desire awoke in them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast, and if they gainsayed the voice, anger was kindled in the hearts of those under the spell. For some the spell lasted only while the voice spoke to them, and when it spoke to another, they smiled, as men do who see through a juggler's trick, while others gape at it. For many the sound of the voice alone was enough to hold them enthralled. But for those whom it conquered, the spell endured when they were far away, and ever they heard that soft voice whispering and urging them. But none were unmoved, none rejected its pleas and its commands without an effort of mind and will, so long as its master had control over it. Well, it said now with gentle question, Why must you disturb my rest? Will you give me no peace at all by night or day? They looked up, astonished, for they had heard no sound of his coming, and they saw a figure standing at the rail, looking down upon them. An old man, swathed in a great cloak, the color of which was not easy to tell, for it changed if they moved their eyes or if he stirred. His face was long, with a high forehead. He had deep darkling eyes, hard to fathom, though the look that they now bore was grave and benevolent, and a little weary. His hair and beard were white, but strands of black still showed about his lips and ears. Like and unlike, muttered Gimli. But come now, said the soft voice. Do at least of you I know by name. 
Gandalf I know too well to have much hope that he seeks help or counsel here. But you, Theoden, Lord of the Mark of Rohan, are declared by your noble devices, and still more by the fair countenance of the House of Eol. O oh, worthy son of Thangel the thrice renowned, why have you not come before and as a friend? Much have I desired to see you, mightiest king of western lands, and especially in these latter years, to save you from the unwise and evil counsels that beset you. Is it yet too late? Despite the injuries that have been done to me in which the men of Rohan, alas, have had some part, Still, I would save you, and deliver you from the ruin that draws nigh inevitably. If you ride upon this road which you have taken, indeed I alone can hate you now. Theoden opened his mouth as if to speak, but he said nothing. He looked up at the face of Saruman with its dark, solemn eyes bent down upon him, and then to Gandalf at his side, and he seemed to hesitate. Gandalf made no sign, but stood silent as stone, as one waiting patiently for some call that has not yet come. The rider stirred at first, murmuring with approval of the words of Saruman, and then they too were silent, as men spellbound. It seemed to them that Gandalf had never spoken so fair and fittingly to their lord. Rough and proud now seemed all his dealings with Theoden, and over their hearts crept a shadow, the fear of a great danger, the end of the mark in a darkness to which Gandalf was driving them while Saruman stood beside a door of escape, holding it half open so that a ray of light came through. There was a heavy silence. It was Gimli the dwarf who broke in suddenly. The words of this wizard stand on their heads. He growled, gripping the handle of his axe. In the language of Orthanc, help means ruin, and saving means slaying, that is plain. But we do not come here to beg. Peace, said Saruman and for a fleeting moment his voice was less suave, and a light flickered in his eyes and was gone. I do not speak to you yet, Gimli, glowing son, he said. Far away is your home, and small concern of yours are the troubles of this land. But it was not by design of your own that you became embroiled in them, and so I will not blame such part as you have played. A valiant one, I doubt not. But I pray you, allow me first to speak with the King of Rohan, my neighbor, and once my friend. What have you to say, Theoden King? Will you have peace with me and all the aid of my knowledge founded in long years can bring? Shall we make our counsels together against evil days, and repair our injuries in such a good will that both our estates shall both come to fairer flower than ever before? Still Theoden did not answer. Whether he strove with anger or doubt, none could say. Eomer spoke. Lord, hear me, he said. Now we feel the peril that we were warned of. Have we ridden forth to victory only to stand at last amazed by an old liar with honey in his forked tongue? So would the trapped wolf speak to the hounds if he could. What aid can he give to you, forsooth? All he desires is to escape from this plight. But will you parley with this dealer in treachery and murder? Remember Theodor de Defors, and the grave of Hammer in Helm's Deep. If we speak of poisoned tongues, what shall we say of yours, young serpent? Said Saruman, and the flash of his anger was now plain to see. But come, Eomer, Eomun's son. He went on with his soft voice again. To every man his part. Valor in arms is yours, and you win high honor thereby. Slay whom your lord names as enemies, and be content. Meddle not in policies which you do not understand. But maybe if you become a king, you will find that he must choose his friends with care. The friendship of Saruman and the power of Orthanc cannot be lightly thrown aside. Whatever grievances real or fancied may lie behind, you have won a battle, but not a war. And that with help on which you cannot count again. You may find the shadow of the wood at your own door next. It is wayward and senseless, and has no love for men. But my lord of Rohan, am I to be called a murderer, because valiant men have fallen in battle? If you go to war, needlessly, for I did not desire it, but then men will be slain. 
but if I am a murderer on that account, then all the house of Aeol is stained with murder, for they have fought many wars, and assailed many who defied them. Yet with some they have afterwards made peace, none the worse for being politic. I say, Veiled and King, shall we have peace and friendship, you and I? It is ours to command. We will have peace, said Theoden at last, thickly and with an effort. Several of the riders cried out gladly. Theoden held up his hand. Yes, we will have peace, he said now in a clear voice. We will have peace when you and your works have perished, and the works of your dark master to whom you would deliver us. You are a liar, Saruman, and a corrupter of men's hearts. You hold out your hand to me, and I perceive only the finger of the claw of Mordor, cruel and cold. Even if your war on me was just, and it was not, for were you ten times as wise, you would have no right to rule me and mine for your own profit as you desired. Even so, what will you say of your torches in Westfold, and the children that lie dead there? And they hewed Hammer's body before the gates of the Hordberg after he was dead? When you hang from a gibbet at your window for the sport of your own crows, I will have peace with you and or thank. So much for the house of Aeol. A lesser son of great sires am I, but I do not need to lick your fingers. Turn else with her. But I fear your voice has lost its charm. The riders gazed up at Theoden like men startled out of a dream. Harsh as an old raven's, their master's voice sounded in their ears after the music of Saruman. But Saruman, for a while, was beside himself with wrath. He leaned over the rail as if he would smite the king with his staff. To some, suddenly it seemed that they saw a snake coiling itself to strike. Gibbets and crows, he hissed, and they shuddered at the hideous change. Don't it! What is the house of Aeol but a thatched barn where brigands drink and reek, and their brats roll on the floor amongst the dogs? Too long have they escaped the gibbet themselves. But the noose comes, slow in the drawing, tight and hard in the end. Hang if you will. Now his voice changed as he slowly mastered himself. I know not why I have had the patience to speak to you. For I need you not, nor your little band of gallopers as swift of fly as to advance Theoden, horse master. Long ago I offered you a state beyond your merit and your wit. I have offered it again, so that those whom you misled may clearly see the choice of roads. You give me brag and abuse. So be it. Go back to your huts. But you, Gandalf, for you at least I am grieved, feeling for your shame. How comes it that you can endure such company? For you are proud, Gandalf, and not without reason. Having a noble mind and eyes that look both deep and far. Even now you will not listen to my counsel. Gandalf stirred and looked up. What have you to say that you did not say at our last meeting? He asked. Or perhaps that you have things to unsay. Saruman paused. Unsay? He mused, as if puzzled. I endeavoured to advise you for your own good, but you scarcely listened. You are proud and do not love advice, having indeed a store of your own wisdom. But on that occasion you erred, I think, misconstruing my intentions willfully. I fear that in my eagerness to persuade you I lost patience, and indeed I regret it. For I bore you no ill will, and even now I bear none, though you return to me in the company of the violent and ignorant. How should I? Are we not both members of a high and ancient order? Most excellent in Middle-earth? Our friendship would profit us both alike. Much we could still accomplish together, to heal the disorders of the world. Let us understand one another and dismiss from thought these lesser folk. Let them wait on our decisions. For the common good, I am willing to redress the past 
and receive you? Will you not consult with me? Will you not come up? So great was the power that Saruman exerted in his last effort that none that stood within hearing were unmoved. But now the spell was wholly different. They heard the gentle remonstrance of a kindly king with an erring but much-loved minister. But they were shut out, listening at a door to words not meant for them, ill-mannered children or stupid servants overhearing the elusive discourse of their elders, and wondering how it would affect their lot. Of loftier mould these two were made, reverend and wise. It was inevitable that they would make alliance. Gandalf would ascend into the tower to discuss deep things beyond their comprehension in the high chambers of Orthanc. The door would be closed and they would be left outside, dismissed to await allotted work or punishment. Even in the mind of Theoden the thought took shape, like a shadow of doubt. He will betray us. He will go. We are lost. <laughs> then Gandalf laughed. The fantasy vanished like a puff of smoke. <laughs> Saruman! Saruman! Said Gandalf, still laughing. Saruman, you missed your path in life. You should have been the king's jester and earned your bread and stripes too by mimicking his counsellors. Ah, me. He paused, getting the better of his mirth. Understand one another? I fear I am beyond your comprehension. But you, Saruman, I understand now too well. I keep a clearer memory of your arguments and deeds than you suppose. When last I visited you, you were the jailer of Mordor, and there I was to be sent. Nay, the guest who has escaped from the roof. I will think twice before he comes back in my door. Nay, I do not think that I will come up. But listen, Saruman, for the last time, will you not come down? Isengard has proved less strong than your hope and fancy made it. So may other things in which you still have trust. Would it not be well to leave it for a while? To turn to new things, perhaps? Think well, Saruman. Will you not come down? A shadow passed over Saruman's face. Then it went deathly white. Before he could conceal it, they saw through the mask the anguish of a mind in doubt, loathing to stay and dreading to leave its refuge. For a second he hesitated, and no one breathed. Then he spoke, and his voice was shrill and cold. Pride and hate were conquering him. Will I come down? He mocked. Does an unarmed man come down to speak with robbers out of doors? I can hear you well enough here. I am no fool, and I do not trust you, Gandalf. They do not stand openly on my stairs, but I know where the wild wood demons are lurking at your command. The treacherous are ever distrustful answered Gandalf wearily. But you need not fear for your skin. I do not wish to kill you or hurt you as you would know if you really understood me. And I have the power to protect you. I am giving you a last chance. You can leave Orthanc free if you choose. <laughs> that sounds well, sneered Saruman. Very much in the manner of Gandalf the Grey, so condescending and so very kind. I do not doubt that you would find Orthanc commodious and my departure convenient. But why should I wish to leave, and what do you mean by free? There are conditions, I presume. Reasons for leaving. You can see from your windows, answered Gandalf. Others will occur to your thought. Your servants are destroyed and scattered. Your neighbors you have made your enemies, and you have cheated your new master, or tried to do so. When his eye turns hither, it will be the red eye of wrath. But when I say free, I mean free. Free from bond, of chain or command. To go where you will, even to Mordor Saruman, if you desire. But you will first surrender to me the key of Orthanc. And your staff. They shall be pledges of your conduct. To be returned later, if you merit them. Saruman's face grew livid, twisted with rage and a red light was kindled in his eyes. He laughed wildly. <laughs> Later! He cried, and his voice rose to a scream. Later, yes, when you also have the keys of Barad-dûr itself, I suppose, and the crowns of seven kings, and the rods of the five wizards, 
and have purchased yourself a pair of boots many times larger than those that you wear now. A modest plan. Hardly one in which my help is needed. I have other things to do. Do not be a fool. If you wish to treat with me while you have a chance, go away and come back when you are sober. And leave behind these cutthroats and small ragtag that dangle at your tail. Good day. Come back, Saruman, said Gandalf in a commanding voice. To the amazement of the others, Saruman turned again, as if dragged against his will. He came slowly back to the iron rail, leaning on it, breathing hard. His face was lined and shrunken. His hand clutched his heavy black staff like a claw. I did not give you leave to go, said Gandalf sternly. I have not finished. You have become a fool, Saruman, and yet pitiable. You might still have turned away from folly and evil and have been of service. But you choose to stay and gnaw at ends of your own spoils. Stay then, but I warn you. You will not easily come out again. Not unless the dark hands of the east stretch out to take you. Saruman! He cried, and his voice grew in power and authority. Behold, I am not Gandalf the Grey, whom you betrayed. I am Gandalf the White, who has returned from death. You have no color now, and I cast you from the Order and from the Council. He raised his hand and spoke slowly, in a clear, cold voice. Saruman, your staff is broken. There was a crack, and the staff split aside from Saruman's hand, and the head of it fell down at Gandalf's feet. Go, said Gandalf. With a cry, Saruman fell back and crawled away. At that moment, a heavy, shining thing came hurtling down from above. It glanced off the iron rail, even as Saruman left it, and passing close to Gandalf's head. It smote the stair on which he stood. The rail rang and snapped. The stair cracked and splintered in glittering sparks, but the ball was unharmed. It rolled on down the steps, a globe of crystal, dark but glowing with a heart of fire. As it bounded away towards a pool, Pippin ran after it and picked it up. The murderous rogue! cried Elmer. But Gandalf was unmoved. No, that was not thrown by Saruman, he said. Nor even at his bidding, I think. It came from a window far above. A parting shot from Master Wormthung, I fancy. But ill aimed. The aim was poor, maybe, because he could not make up his mind which he hated more, you or Saruman, said Aragorn. That may be, sir, said Gandalf. Small comfort will those who have in their companionship. They will gnaw at one another with words. But the punishment is just. If Wormtongue ever comes out of Orthanc alive, it will be more than he deserves. Yeah, my lad, I'll take that. Why did not I... He cried, turning sharply and seeing Pippin coming up the steps slowly, as if he were bearing a great weight. He went down to meet him and hastily took the dark globe from the hobbit, wrapping it into the folds of his cloak. I will take care of this, he said. It is not a thing, I guess, that Saruman would have chosen to cast away. Said Gimli. Throw, at least. It is the end, said Gandalf. Let us go. They turned their backs on the doors of Orthanc and went down. The riders hailed the king with joy and saluted Gandalf. The spell of Saruman was broken. They had seen him come at call and crawl away, dismissed. Well, that is done, said Gandalf. Now I must find Treebeard and tell him how things have gone. He will have guessed, surely said Merry. Were they likely to end any other way? Not likely, answered Gandalf, though they came to the balance of a hair. But I had reasons for trying, some merciful and some less so. First, Saruman was shown that the power of his voice was waning. He cannot be both tyrant and counsellor. When the plot is ripe, it remains no longer secret. Yet he fell into the trap, and tried to deal with his victims piecemeal, while others listened. Then I gave him a last choice and a fair one, to renounce both Mordor and his private schemes and make amends by helping us in our need. He knows our need, none better. Great service he would have rendered, but he has chosen to withhold it and keep the power of Orthanc. He will not serve, only command. He lives now in terror of the shadow of Mordor, and yet he still dreams of riding the storm. Unhappy fool, he will be devoured, 
if the power of the East stretches out its arms to Isengard. We cannot destroy Orthanc from without. But Sauron, who knows what he can do? And what? Asked Pippin. I? Nothing, said Gandalf. I will do nothing to him. I do not wish for mastery. What will become of him, I cannot say. I grieve that so much that was good now festers in the tower. Still for things that have not gone badly. Strange are the turns of fortune. Often does hatred hurt itself. I guess that even if we had entered in, we could have found few treasures in Orthanc, more precious than the thing which Wormtongue threw down at us. A shrill shriek suddenly cut off came from an open window high above. <laughs> it seemed that Saruman thinks so too, said Gandalf. Let us leave them. They returned now to the ruins of the gate. Hardly had they passed out under the arch, when, from among the shadows of the piled stones, where they had stood, Treebird and a dozen other Ents came striding up. Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas gazed at them in wonder. There are three of them, Treebird, said Gandalf. I have spoken of them, but you have not seen them. He named them one by one. The old end looked at them long and searchingly, and spoke to them in turn. Last he turned to Legolas. So you have come all the way from Mirkwood, my good elf. Ah, very great forest it used to be. And still is, said Legolas, but not so great that we who dwell there ever tire of seeing new trees. I would dearly love to journey in Fangorn's wood. I scarcely passed beyond the eaves of it, and I did not wish to turn back. Treebeard's eyes gleamed with pleasure. I hope you may have your wish here the hills be much older, he said. I will come, if I have the fortune, said Legolas. I have made a bargain with my friend that if all goes well, we will visit Fangorn together, by your leave. Any health that comes with you will be welcome, said Treebeard. The friend I speak of is not an elf, said Legolas. I mean Gimli, Gloin's son here. Gimli bowed low, and the axe slipped from his belt and clattered on the ground. Mm -hmm. Ah, no, said Treebeard, looking dark-eyed at him. A dwarf and an axe-bearer. Mm -hmm. I have good will to elves, but you ask much. This is a strange friendship. Strange it may seem, said Legolas. But while Gimli lives, I shall not come to Fangorn alone. His axe is not for trees, but for Orknex, O Fangorn, master of Fangorn's wood. Forty-two he hewed in the battle. Ooh, come now, said Treebeard. That is a better story. Well, well, things will go as they will, and there is no need to hurry to meet them. But now we must part for a while. Day is drawing to an end, yet Gandalf says you must go ere nightfall and the Lord of the Mark is eager for his own house. Yes, we must go and go now, said Gandalf. I fear that I must take your gatekeepers from you, but you will manage well enough without them. Maybe I shall, said Treebeard. But I shall miss them. We have become friends in so short a while that I think I must be getting hasty. Growing backwards towards youth, perhaps. But there, they are the first new thing under the sun or moon that I have seen for many a long, long day. I shall not forget them. I have put their names into the long list. Hence will remember it. Hence the earthborn, old. Oh, as mountains, the wide walkers, water drinking, and hungry as hunters, the hobbit children, the laughing folk, the little people. They shall remain friends as long as leaves are renewed. Fare you well, but if you hear news up in your present land, in the Shire, Send me word. You know what I mean. 
word or sight of the Entwives. Come yourselves if you can. We will, said Merry and Pippin together, and they turned away hastily. Treebeard looked at them and was silent for a while, shaking his head thoughtfully. Then he turned to Gandalf. So Saruman would not leave? He said. I did not think he would. His heart is as rotten as a black horn's. Still, if I were overcome and all my trees destroyed, I would not come while I had one dark hope left to hide in. No, said Gandalf. But you have not plotted to cover all the world with your trees and choke all other living things. But there it is. Saruman remains to nurse his hatred and weave again such webs as he can. He has the key of Orthanc, but he must not be allowed to escape. Indeed, no. Hence we'll see to that, said Treebeard. Saruman shall not set foot beyond the rock without my leave. Hence we'll watch over him. Good, said Gandalf. That is what I hoped. Now I can go and turn to other matters with one care the less. But you must be wary. The waters have gone down. It will not be enough to put sentinels around the tower, I fear. I do not doubt that there were deep ways delved under Orthanc, and that Saruman hopes to go and come on Mart before long. If you will undertake the labor, I beg you to pour in the waters again, and do so until Isengard remains a standing pool, or you discover the outlets. When all the underground places are drowned, and the outlets blocked, then Saruman must stay upstairs and look out of the windows. Leave it to the ends, said Treebeard. We shall search the valley from head to foot and peer under every pebble. Trees are coming back to live here. Old trees. Wild trees. The Watchwood, we will call it. Not a squirrel will go here, but I shall know of it. Leave it to the ends, until seven times the years in which he tormented us have passed. We shall not tire of watching him. The sun was sinking behind the long western arm of the mountains when Gandalf and his companions and the king with his riders set out again from Isengard. Gandalf took Merry behind him, and Aragorn took Pippin. Two of the king's men went on ahead, riding swiftly, and passed soon out of sight down into the valley. The others followed at an easy pace. Ents in a solemn row stood like statues at the gate, with their long arms uplifted, but they made no sound. Merry and Pippin looked back when they had passed some way down the winding road. Sunlight was still shining in the sky. But long shadows reached over Isengard, grey ruins falling into darkness. Treebeard stood alone there now, like the distant stump of an old tree. The hobbits thought of their first meeting upon the sunny ledge far away on the borders of Fangor. They came to the Pillar of the White Hand. The pillar was still standing, but the graven hand had been thrown down and broken into small pieces. Right in the middle of the road the long forefinger lay, white in the dusk, its red nail darkening to black. The ends pay attention to every detail, said Gandalf. They rode on, and evening deepened in the valley. Are we riding for tonight, Gandalf? Asked Merry after a while. I don't know how you feel with the small ragtag dangling behind you, but the ragtag is tired and will be glad to stop dangling and then lie down. So you heard that? Said Gandalf. Don't let it wrangle. Be thankful no longer words were aimed at you. He had his eyes on you. If it is any comfort to your pride, I should say that at the moment you and Pippin are more in his thoughts than all the rest of us. Who you are, how you came here, and why. What you know, whether you were captured, and if so, how you escaped when all the orcs perished. It is with those little riddles that the great mind of Saruman is troubled. A sneer from him, Meriadoc, is a compliment, if you feel honored by his concern. Thank you, said Merry. But it is a greater honor to dangle at your tail, Gandalf. For one thing, in that position, one has the chance of putting a question a second time. Are you riding far tonight? Gandalf laughed. A most unquenchable hobbit. All wizards should have a hobbit or two in their care, to teach them the meaning of the word and to correct them. I beg your pardon. 
but I have given thought even to these simple matters. We will ride for a few hours, gently, until we come to the end of the valley. Tomorrow we must ride faster. When we came, we meant to go straight from Isengard back to the king's house at Hedorash over the plains, a ride of some days. But we have taken thought and changed the plan. Messengers have gone ahead to Helm's Deep to warn them that the king is returning tomorrow. We will ride from there with many men to Dunharrow by paths among the hills. From now on, no more than two or three together are to go openly over the land, by day or night, when it can be avoided. Nothing or a double helping is your way, said Mary. I'm afraid I was not looking beyond tonight's bed. Where and what are Helm's Deep and all the rest of it? I don't know anything about this country. Then you'd best learn something if you wish to understand what is happening. And not just now, and not from me. I have too many pressing things to think about. All right. I'll tackle Strider by the campfire. He's less testy. But why all this secrecy? I thought we won the battle. Yes, we have won, but only the first victory. And that in itself increases our danger. There was some link between Isengard and Mordor which I have not yet fathomed. How they exchanged news, I am not sure, but they did so. The Eye of Baradur will be looking impatiently towards the Visit's Vale, I think. And towards Rohan. The less it sees, the better. The road passed slowly, winding down the valley, now further and now nearer Aizen flowed in its stony bed. Night came down from the mountains. All the mists were gone. A chill wind blew. The moon, now waxing round, filled the eastern sky with a pale cold sheen. The shoulders of the mountain to their right sloped down to bare hills. The wide plains opened grey before them. At last they halted. Then they turned aside, leaving the highway and taking to the sweet upland turf again. Going westward a mile or so, they came to a dale. It opened southward, leaning back into the slope of round Dol Baran, the last hill of the northern ranges, green-footed, crowned with heather. The sides of the glen were shaggy with last year's bracken, among which the tight-curled fronds of spring were just thrusting through the sweet-scented earth. Thorn brushes grew thick upon the low banks, and under them they made their camp, two hours or so before the middle of the night. They lit a fire in a hollow, down among the roots of a spreading hawthorn, tall as a tree, riven with age. But hail in every limb, buds were swelling at each twig's tip. Guards were set, two at a watch. The rest, after they had supped, wrapped themselves in a cloak and blanket, and slept. The hobbits lay in a corner by themselves upon a pile of old bracken. Mary was sleepy, but Pippin now seemed curiously restless. The bracken cracked and rustled as he twisted and turned. What's the matter? Asked Mary. Are you lying on an anthill? No. Said Pippin. But I'm not comfortable. I wonder how long it's been since I slept on my bed. Mary yawned. I'll work it out with your fingers. He said. But you must know how long it is since we left Lorien. Oh, that. Said Pippin. I'm in a real bed in a bedroom. Well, Rivendell then said Mary. But I could sleep anywhere tonight. You had the luck, Mary, said Pippin softly after a long pause. You were riding with Gandalf. Well, well what of it? Did you get any news? Any information out of him? Yes, a good deal. More than usual. But you heard it all, or most of it. You were close by, and we were talking no secrets. But you can go with him tomorrow if you think you can get more out of him, and if he'll have you. Can I? Good. But he's close, isn't he? Not changed at all. Oh, yes, he is, said Mary, waking up a little and beginning to wonder what was bothering his companion. Gandalf is white now. Saruman came when he was told, and his rod was taken, and he was just told to go, and he went. Well, if Gandalf changed it all, then it's closer than ever, that's all. Pippin argued. That glass bowl now. He seemed mighty pleased with it. He knows or guesses something about it. But does he tell us what? No, not a word. Yet I picked it up and I saved it from rolling into a pool. Here, I'll take that, my lad, that's all. I wonder what it is. It felt so very heavy. 
Pippin's voice fell very low, as if he was talking to himself. Hello, said Mary. So that's what is bothering you? Now, Pippin, my lad, don't forget Gildor's saying, the one Sam used to quote. Do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. But our whole life for months has been one long meddling in the affairs of wizards, said Pippin. I should like a bit of information as well as danger. I should like a look at that ball. Go to sleep, said Mary. You'll get information enough sooner or later. My dear Pippin, no chuke ever beat a brandy buck for inquisitiveness. But is this the time, I ask you? All right. What's the harm in my telling you what I should like? I look at that stone. I know I can't have it, with old Gandalf sitting on it like an hen on an egg. But it doesn't help much to get no more from you than a you can't have it, so go to sleep. Well, what else could I say? Said Mary. I'm sorry, Pippin, but you really must wait till the morning. I'll be as curious as you like after breakfast, and I'll help in any way I can at Wizard Weedling. But I can't keep awake any longer. If I aren't any more, I shall split at the ears. Good night. Pippin said no more. He lay still now, but sleep remained far away, and it was not encouraged by the sound of Mary breathing softly, asleep in a few minutes after saying good night. The thought of the dark globe seemed to grow stronger as all grew quiet. Pippin felt again its weight in his hands, and saw again the mysterious red depths into which he had looked for a moment. He tossed and turned and tried to think of something else. At last he could stand it no longer. He got up and looked round. It was chilly, and he wrapped his cloak about him. The moon was shining cold and white, down into the dell, and the shadows of the bushes were black. All about lay sleeping shapes. The two guards were not in view. They were up on the hill, perhaps, or hidden in the bracken. Driven by some impulse that he did not understand, Pippin walked softly to where Gandalf lay. He looked down at him. The wizard seemed asleep, but with lids not fully closed. There was a glitter of eyes under his long lashes. Pippin stepped back hastily. But Gandalf made no sign. And drawn forward once more, half against his will, the hobbit crept up again from behind the wizard's head. He was rolled in a blanket with his cloak spread over the top, and close beside him, between his right side and his bent arm, there was a hummock. Something round wrapped in a dark cloth, his hand seemed only just to have slipped off it to the ground. Hardly breathing, Pippin crept nearer, foot by foot. At last he knelt down. Then he put his hands out stealthily, and slowly lifted the lump up. It did not seem quite so heavy as he had expected. Only some bottle of augments, perhaps, after all. He thought with a strange sense of relief, but he did not put the bundle down again. He stood for a moment, clasping it. Then an idea came into his mind. He tiptoed away, found a large stone, and came back. Quickly now he drew off the cloth, wrapped the stone in it, and kneeling down, laid it back by the wizard's hand. Then at last he looked at the thing that he had uncovered. There it was. A smooth globe of crystal, now dark and dead, lying bare before his knees. Pippin lifted it, covered it hurriedly in his own cloak, and half turned to go back to his bed. At that moment Gandalf moved in his sleep and muttered some words. They seemed to be in a strange tongue. His hand groped out and clasped the wrapped stone, and he sighed and did not move again. You idiotic fool. Pippin muttered to himself. You're going to get yourself into frightful trouble. Put it back quick. But he found now that his knees quaked and he did not dare to go near enough to the wizard to reach the bundle. I'll never get it back now without waking him. He thought. Not till I'm a bit calmer. So I may as well have a look first. Not just here, though. He strolled away and sat down on a green hillock not far from his bed. The moon looked in over the edge of the dell. Pippin sat with his knees drawn up and the ball between them. He bent low over it, looking like a greedy child stooping over a bowl of food in a corner away from others. He drew his cloak aside and gazed at it. The air seemed still and tense about him. At first the globe was dark, black as jet, with the moonlight gleaming from its surface. Then there came a faint glow and stir in the heart of it, and it held his eyes, so that he could not look away. Soon all the inside seemed on fire. 
The ball was spinning, while the lights within were revolving. Suddenly the lights went out. He gave a gasp and struggled, but he remained bent, clasping the ball with both hands. Closer and closer he bent, and then became rigid. His lips moved soundlessly for a while. Then with a strangled cry he fell back and lay still. The cry was piercing. The guards leapt down from the banks. All the camp was soon astir. So this is the thief, said Gandalf. Hastily he cast his cloak over the blow where it lay. But you, Pippin, this is a grievous turn to things. He knelt by Pippin's body. The hobbit was lying on his back, rigid, with unseeing eyes staring up at the sky. The devilry. What mischief has he done to himself and to all of us? The wizard's face was drawn and haggard. He took Pippin's hand and bent over his face, listening for his breath. Then he laid his hands on his brow. The hobbit shuddered. His eyes closed. He cried out and sat up, staring in bewilderment at all the faces around him, pale in the moonlight. Not for you, Saruman! He cried in a shrill and toneless voice, shrinking away from Gandalf. I will send for it at once! Do you understand? Say just that! Then he struggled to get up and escape, but Gandalf held him gently and firmly. Peregrine Chuk! He said, Come back. The hobbit relaxed and fell back, clinging to the wizard's hand. Gandalf! He cried. Forgive me. Forgive you? Said the wizard. Tell me first what you have done. I took the ball and looked at it, stammered Pippin. And I saw things that frightened me. And I wanted to go away, but I couldn't. And then he came and questioned me. And he looked at me. And. and. That won't do, said Gandalf sternly. What did you see, and what did you say? Pippin shut his eyes and shivered, but said nothing. They all stared at him in silence except Merry, who turned away. But Gandalf's face was still hard. Speak, he said. In a low, hesitating voice, Pippin began again, and slowly his words grew clearer and stronger. Sky and tall battlements, he said. And tiny stars, it seemed very far away and long ago, yet hard and clear. Then the stars went in and out, and they were cutting off by things with wings, very big, I think, really. But in the glass, they looked like bats, wheeling around the corner. I thought there were nine of them. One began to fly straight towards me, getting bigger and bigger. It's horrible. Oh no, I can't say. I tried to get away because I thought it would fly out. But when it had covered all the globe, it disappeared. Then, he came. He did not speak, so that I could hear words. you neglected to report this for so long? I did not answer. He said, Who are you? I still did not answer. But it hurt me horribly. And he pressed me. So I said, Oh, bit. Then suddenly he seemed to see me. And he laughed at me. He was cruel. It was like being stabbed with knives. I struggled. But he said, Wait a moment. We shall meet again soon. <laughs> Tell Saruman that his dainty is not for him. I will send for it at once. Do you understand? Say just that. Then he gloated over me. I felt like I was falling to pieces. Oh no, I, I can't say anymore. I don't remember anything Look else. Look at me, said Gandalf. Pippin looked straight up into his eyes. The wizard held his gaze for a moment in silence. Then his face grew gentler, and the shadow of a smile appeared. He laid his hand softly on Pippin's head. All right, he said. Say no more. You have taken no harm. 
There is no lie in your eyes, as I feared. But he did not speak long with you. A fool. But an honest fool you remain, Peregrine Duke. Wiser ones might have done worse in such a pass. But mark this. You have been saved. And all your friends too. Mainly by good fortune, as it is called. You cannot count on it a second time. If he had questioned you then and there, almost certainly you would have told all that you know. To the ruin of us all. But he was too eager. He did not want information only. He wanted you. Quickly, so that he could deal with you in the Dark Tower, slowly. Don't shudder. If you will meddle with the affairs of wizards, you must be prepared to think of such things. But come. I forgive you. Be comforted. Things have not turned out as evilly as they might. He lifted Pippin gently and carried him back to his bed. Mary followed, and sat down beside him. Lie there and rest if you can, Pippin, said Gandalf. Trust me, if you feel an itch in your palms again, tell me of it. Such things can be cured. But anyway, my dear hobbit, don't put a lump of rock under my elbow again. Now, I will leave you two together for a while. With that, Gandalf returned to the others, who were still standing by the Orthanc stone, in troubled thought. Peril comes in the light when least expected, he said. We have had a narrow escape. How is the hobbit Pippin? Asked Aragorn. I think all will be well now, answered Gandalf. He was not held long, and hobbits have an amazing power of recovery. The memory or the horror of it will probably fade quickly. Too quickly, perhaps. Will you, Aragorn, take the Orthanc stone and guard it? It is a dangerous charge. Dangerous indeed, but not to all, said Aragorn. There is one who may claim it by right. For this assuredly is the Palantir of Orthanc from the treasury of Elendil, set here by the kings of Gondor. Now my hour draws near. I will take it. Gandalf looked at Aragorn, and then, to the surprise of the others, he lifted the covered stone and bowed as he presented it. Receive it, Lord, he said, in earnest of other things that shall be given back. But if I may counsel you in the use of your own, do not use it. Yet, be wary. When have I been hasty or unwary, who have waited and prepared for so many long years? Said Aragorn. Never yet. Do not then stumble at the end of the road, answered Gandalf. But at the least, keep this thing secret. You and all others that stand here. The hobbit Peregrine, above all, should not know where it is bestowed. The evil fit may come on him again, for alas, he has handled it and looked at it. As should never have happened. He ought never to have touched it in Isengard, and there I should have been quicker. But my mind was bent on Saruman, and I did not at once guess the nature of the stone. Then I was weary. And as I lay pondering it, sleep overcame me. Now I know. Yes, there can be no doubt, said Aragorn. At last we know the link between Isengard and Mordor, and how it worked. Much is explained. Our enemies and strange weaknesses, said Theoden. But it has long been said, oft evil will shall evil mar. That many times is seen, said Gandalf. But at this time we have been strangely fortunate. Maybe I have been saved by this hobbit from grave blunder. I have considered whether or not to probe this stone myself to find its uses. Had I done so, I should have been revealed to him myself. I am not ready for such a trial, if indeed I shall ever be so. But even if I found the power to withdraw myself, it would be disastrous for him to see me yet, until the hour comes when secrecy will avail no longer. That hour is come, I think, said Aragorn. Not yet, said Gandalf. There remains a short while of doubt which we must use. The enemy, it is clear, thought that the stone was in Orthanc. Why should he not? And that, therefore, the hobbit was captive there, driven to look in the glass for his torment by Saruman. That dark mind will be filled now with the voice and face of the hobbit, and with expectation. It may take some time before he learns his error. We must snatch that time, 
We have been too leisurely. We must move. The neighborhood of Isengard is no place now to linger in. I will ride ahead at once with Peregrine Took. It will be better for him than lying in the dark while others sleep. I will keep airmen and ten riders, said the king. They shall ride with